Okay, hi everyone, thanks for the intro. Um, pretty accurate. So I, as you said, I work in Akato, um, which is a, it's a geospatial company, um, but my main focus is on DeckGL, an open source rendering framework, and integrating that um, with Akato systems. So this talk is gonna be focusing on rendering large data sets using vector tiles in DeckGL. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to give a little overview of DeckGL because I think a lot of people have heard of it, but maybe not familiar with how it works uh, in detail. Then I'm going to talk a bit about vector tiles, how to render them, style them, and filter them. And finally, I'm going to go on to two developments on more of the technical side, which we've done in the last year um, to make vector tiles work um, really nicely. One is uh, binary data format. And the second is uh, GPU masking. Okay, so a quick recap of DeckGL. Um, it's a JavaScript library for big data visualization. And the core component in DeckGL is something called a layer. So this is something which lets you define in a declarative way how you'd like to map some data that you have, and this can be in a variety of data formats, to a visualization. And even though this is running in the browser, then it runs pretty quickly thanks to using the GPU, um, which is the graphics card in the browser, to accelerate the rendering using uh, WebGL. I would just uh, make a call out to my colleague Borja, who yesterday had a talk, um, which was more kind of an introductory overview of DeckGL. So I would encourage you to take a look at that um, at a recording if you find this interesting. So first off, I would like to kind of clear up something which I find is something um, of a misconception with DeckGL. Um, DeckGL is not uh, a base map library. It's a pure visualization library that sits on top of a base map library. So you would typically use DeckGL on top of another rendering library, um, a map rendering library like MapLibre or Leaflet or, or Google Maps. Um, and then DeckGL will draw its layers on top in a separate context. So that is what this diagram here is showing. Um, we have a collection of DeckGL layers, one uh, the blue arc layers, and a second one um, a scatter plot layer, so this is just a bunch of points. DeckGL is gonna draw these together onto one canvas, and then separately uh, a mapping library. Here the example is um, Mapbox. It is gonna draw the streets, the labels, the buildings, and these two are gonna get linked together by the browser in a way that it appears to be a seamless um, visualization to the user. So from the user's perspective, they can't tell that it's um, basically two libraries at the same time. And one great use case um, that this architecture gives us is the ability to swap out the base maps. So you can build your application using DeckGL and have Google Maps. Um, but if later on the client says, actually, I want to switch to my own tile server and you want to use MapLibre instead, then you can just swap out that library and everything will work as before. You're not being tied to the API of the base map library. Okay, I just have a short demo here of how we can do the most kind of basic mapping of data to a layer. And if some of you have your computers, then I've put a live version uh, here on JS Fiddle that you can play around with and see that really doing a simple visualization in DeckGL is like maybe 20 lines of code. So here I have some example data in JSON format. It's just a list of what are airports um, with each object having some coordinates and each uh, airport having either a major or a minor type. Uh, to render this in DeckGL, um, all we have to do is initialize a DeckGL object and define an initial view state, which is basically saying where is our map going to start? So what latitude, what longitude, and what zoom? Tell DeckGL that we want this to be interactive by adding the controller. So when we just like click and drag and pan and zoom and all of these things that we're used to from web maps, the map is going to update. And then the core part is this um, collection of layers. So here we just have one. And you can probably understand what some of these things are doing. So I'm just pulling the data from this JSON file. Um, I'm setting the radius to be a minimum of three pixels. But the core part to understand, and this is quite different from other visualization libraries, are these two functions in the middle, which are called accessors. So this is the way that DeckGL 
is informed how you'd like to map your data to the visualization. So, so this function, get position, is going to be called automatically by DeckGL on every object in your data array, and it's going to pull out the position and say, okay, this is where I want to have it on the map. And similarly with the fill color, it's going to look at the type, and if it's a major airport, then it's going to color it with one color. So here in this case, it's red, and if it's not, it's just going to use black. So this is the result that you'd get from this um, map with some points on it, nothing surprising. Okay, so what are vector tiles? The example that I was just showing you now then is just some static data, and this has got some pretty big limitations in the browser if you are rendering a large data set. So if we're talking like a billion rows or something like that, there's just no way that you can download this much data into the browser in a fast way. If you're trying to solve this problem, another way that you might sort of display all this data is to stream it in piece by piece, but still you're gonna be hitting browser limits and it's not gonna work. So the correct solution to make such a big data set um, renderable in the browser is to split it and aggregate it into tiles. So when you have the whole world, then you have an overview, and then as you zoom in, the browser is downloading more and more detailed information um, to draw the tiles that you're actually focusing on. And vector tiles is basically a quite uh, generic concept. Like, it's essentially a way of tiling geographic information, which can be points, polygons, lines, or even spatial indices in a, a tiled manner. So in DeckGL, the first format that we supported is the most common one, um, map box vector tiles. But really, because of the way the architecture of DeckGL works, you can plug in pretty much any format. You could have your tiles contain JSON or GeoJSON or CSV or well-known binary, pretty much anything that you'd want. It will still work nicely. So an example of how we'd go about styling vector tiles, um, it's pretty much the same as with the static data set. The only difference is that rather than downloading the static data, we point DeckGL at uh, an MVT endpoint using this um, template here. So as the user is gonna move the map around and pan and zoom, then DeckGL is gonna automatically download the individual vector tiles, and it's then gonna use the same styling language as we had before, except it's gonna apply it to each tile individually. And here, this pattern of accessors comes in and shows kind of how it's nice and powerful because you don't actually have to worry about the data format you're working with. You just have to worry about how do I map the individual properties of um, my features to something visible on screen. Uh, yep, I think I've covered this. Um, I'll just show a quick demo here to show that in um, practice, when you're trying to create a visualization, um, people would use some kind of UI where rather than going along and typing colors and manually setting pixel sizes, um, you can use a UI. And here, this example is an open source library called Kepler GL, which is built on top of DeckGL. And here, you can, using a bunch of um, predefined color styles, um, drop boxes, sliders, configure your map in a way that looks good for you. Um, so typically you'd have some kind of cartographer or designer who would create this and then let the developer know, okay, this is the style that I want and you would put this into your application. Okay, so now onto what I think is the part that really shows some of the power of, um, of DeckGL and vector tiles, which is um, filtering. So, because in a vector tile, all of our features are stored um, with like their metadata, we can instruct DeckGL to filter them at runtime um, in a way that we couldn't do with raster tiles. And the way this works with DeckGL is that you instantiate an extension which enables this data filtering, and you add an extra accessor here um, called get filter value. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna instruct DeckGL to pick out a specific property to use for filtering. So here this property is gonna be time, and separately I've specified in the filter range the filter that I want the GPU to do the filtering based on. 
what is um, very powerful about this approach is that this filtering is happening directly on the graphics card. So all of the data is uploaded there with this defined filter of time. And then on every frame as the user is changing the user interface or creating an animation, then the only thing that's being updated between the JavaScript and the graphics card is this filter range. So the animation is running super smooth, like no processing is being done in JavaScript at all, and it's as if you weren't um, doing anything in, in the web page. So it's gonna run uh, very, very quickly. Okay, a couple of improvements that we've done um, in this last year that actually make these things possible. Um, I'd first wanna talk a bit about um, how we work with the data, the binary data in the MVT layer. And the next, um, uh, even more powerful way of doing um, filtering on the GPU using uh, the new mask extension. Uh, so historically, the way the NVT layer worked um, was that we had some code which could decode MVT tiles into GeoJSON, and then DECGL could render GeoJSON. And this is quite a common way that libraries work because GeoJSON is more or less the de facto standard because it's easy to understand for humans. But that doesn't mean that it's fast to render. And the core problem is quite clear to see from this kind of like stage of rendering that we have in DECGL where when we're looking at the actual um, vector tiles, then they are in a binary column-based format. So all of the positions in memory are right next to each other, and then after that we ha might have all of the colors, and then after that we might have the sizes. This is completely different to JSON, where we're grouping things by object. So converting from one format to another one is uh, quite expensive. When it comes to actually drawing using the GPU, then we have to go back to a column-based format. That's just something the GPU requires and there's no getting around that. So essentially we're going from one format only to go back to the other one, which first of all is a lot of CPU power, but secondly is creating lots and lots of garbage, which means the JavaScript and, um, uh, engine has to do garbage collection, which means your web page kind of slows down and stutters and leads to bad user experience. Unsurprisingly, the way that we fixed this was by getting rid of this middle step and rewriting the MVT layer in a way that it could deal with the binary data natively. Um, so this was a great first step to getting better performance. Um, basically, the parsing speed has doubled. Um, but one thing that is quite exciting about this is that it makes it much easier to introduce other column-based formats. Um, so some of the other talks at uh, this conference have talked about things like GeoParquet and GeoArrow, and these are super, super fast formats, like some of the performance charts that I've seen here, then the parsing and filtering speed is super quick. But an added bonus of these formats is that they're almost the same as the format that we want to upload to the graphics card. So not only are you getting better filtering with these um, new formats, but when it comes to actually rendering them to screen, it's gonna be much, much quicker. Um, so this is something that we're looking at in, uh, in DECGL, where we can take um, GeoArrow specifically and have a loader for it that can natively draw it onto the graphics card. Um, so this binary mode that we have in the MVT layer, um, because we are using access to, to style um, the data is essentially completely transparent to the user in most cases if you're not doing something quite complex. So you basically can just switch it on and it is on by default and things would just run quicker. You don't have to, to care about it. You just um, use your accesses through the styling and your applications will work. Okay, so the final part um, I'd like to talk about is the mask extension which is um, kind of similar to like uh, a lasso tool um, that you might have in Photoshop, um, where you can define one layer as a mask for another layer. And this masking is being done in real time on the GPU. So this example we have here is from a UI tool that we have at Carto, where the user can just draw a shape on a map and move it around and it will automatically filter the polygons that we have inside of that tool. 
So the way this works um, is that we have um, at least two layers where one of them is designated as a mask and you can draw anything into this layer. In this example, I'm just drawing um, a square. And then you have another layer which references this first layer um, and its data is then masked. So this scatter plot layer that's uh, second from the left is not being masked. When we apply the mask, then only those circles which are within this masked area remain on screen. And we can also choose to switch to a different mode where we're not masking by object, uh, but ma masking by kind of pixel. And I'll show some examples of this in a second. So here is an example of how we do this in code. Um, again, because we're defining this in a declarative way, it actually becomes pretty easy to create a quite complex visualization. So here I'm loading one GeoJSON layer in from a GeoJSON file, so the whole of Italy, and instructing DeckGL to, rather than draw it to screen, draw it with this mask operation. So we won't actually see it in our visualization. And then the second layer that's below it is more or less the same as the one we had before, where it's just a list of airports. But we're saying, OK, take a mask with mask ID, Italy mask, and apply this to this layer. So we're going to end up with airports that are only in Italy. So here I have an example of something similar, where one data set is all of the cities in the world. Another one is a set of time zones. And as the user clicks a time zone, then that becomes the currently active mask and it's going to mask out only the cities within that time zone. So I'd like to dig in a bit deeper on this um, masking by instance. Um, so depending on what data format you have, if it's points, then those by default are going to be marked, uh, masked by instance because it makes sense that you keep your entire circles. You don't want to clip your markers. But things like lines and polygons generally will be clipped. But this can be overridden by setting a property. So this example here shows um, all of the flights between cities in the US. And as the user clicks on a certain state, then it's masking those arcs by instance so that uh, these lines are not getting cut off by the boundary of the state, but it's keeping the whole object. By contrast, the lines and polygons within the state uh, so the roads and fields are getting clipped at the edge. So you get this nice visualization of the state being clipped at the boundary, but the lines going everywhere. You can even define more than one mask at the same time, up to four. So here I have one mask doing the same thing as before, where the um, arcs are going to different states. But then the second mask is masking a different set of layers, um, which are showing just the points for the airports, and then also buffer zones of, I think, 100 kilometers around uh, each airport. And here, I've done the opposite thing, where I've taken these circles, which normally would be masked by instance, and said, no, I want these to be masked, like clipped. So the buffers don't extend beyond uh, the edge of the, of the state. OK. One more minute, and I have just one more example. Um, here, this is taking all of the things that I've been talking about. So this is a vector tile data set of a billion rows of population data in the US. And the user interface here is both filtering it down based on some parameter using this widget on the right-hand side, and then further filtering it down using this lasso tool. OK, that's pretty much all I have. I'll just use the last 30 seconds to say that we're looking for contributors to join um, our project. Um, so if this uh, seems interesting to you, then please check out our, um, our GitHub or our Slack channel. Um, and I'll also just do a quick call out um, for my company, Carto. If anyone is looking for a job in this area, then come talk to me or check out our website. And with that, I say thank you. And uh, any questions? Thank you.